listening. Okay. Yeah, so Father, we do just, um, I, I will really thank you for that truth and that, that the gospel is good news. And, um, and round this room, um, we could tell story after story of how we've seen it touch people. And just as we came in and chatting, we're talking about those, those stories of so-and-so and then they got saved and they read the Bible in a year. <laughs> so-and-so, they got touched in this way. And that, that is the nature of really what you're about. That's where the life is, that, that we have a book that leads us into life, but it's not the life itself. Um, and so Jesus this evening we just um we just keep on we look for those nuggets that help us to get hold of this book in a way that, that leads us into life. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So um if I, I'm gonna we we're gonna look first at the kind of the Passover um and the and the leaving of Egypt, then we're gonna look at the crossing of the Red Sea tonight. So we've got our, our kind of two halves. Um, and, and for those, um, as Mike is a new person here, the, the focus of what we've done has been very kind of, very focused. We've been trying to focus on the, on the kind of historical background, the historical evidence, because it's a, um, the, the, the key thing with, with Exodus is, like, like with the Gospels, is it has to be rooted in real history. Um, and although there's a huge amount of Judaism nowadays that sees it because they've so, become so insecure in what they've been told, um, and so I was reading an article just last week by by um, those with a Jewish background saying, well, Moses is almost certainly a, a mythical character that's been constructed by the, the writers and so on, thinking, well, you just don't realise just how much there is here. <laughs> and so we've been in many ways focusing on the kind of the, the historical aspects to, because um, uh, we, there, there's always an element to which um, the ancient world doesn't write history the way we think they should write history. So there's always a... A, a layer where we've often misunderstood or we've made it too simplistic and so on but that's not the same as it not being historical if, if that makes sense um, sometimes people do get confused by the two and they think you're being you're kind of saying that something in the bible is not true or you're not you're saying that in terms of the culture of its day what they're saying is this um, and I think we've touched on that before that you know that it's um, a cultural culturally we find um, in in um, a lot in Hebrew that absolutes are used for relatives and relatives are used for absolutes, you know, so by which I mean, um, you yeah, know, that, that, uh, that Jacob um, hated Leah and loved, uh, loved Rachel, you know, um, but he hated Leah so much he had four boys and one girl by her, isn't it? So no, five boys and one girl, I think, no, four, yeah, four and one. <laughs> so, you know, he, it's, not, it's not kind of absolute, it's relative. It's saying that actually his preference was for Rachel. And then Jesus says things like, you know, <laughs> Um, many are called, but few are chosen, by which he really means everybody's called, but few are chosen, if I can put it that way. It's the, it's the, the way we say, it's actually we understand that's, that's the way it goes. And that kind of cultural thing we hit, and we're going to hit a bit of that tonight because we're going to have to look at the numbers. Um, and it's one of the ways, I, I, it's one of these areas where I, I'm most nervous about doing these things because you always have the potential of upsetting people by showing them certain things that are a bit confusing. Um, but at the same time, if we shy away from it, what you then find is people go off to, you know, it, it happens quite regularly. One of the worst anti-Christian atheist writers on the web today <laughs> is a guy who used to be a Pentecostal minister, but it was his ministry training, discovering things that he never got taught and, see, you know, that made him so lose his faith. He became so um, anti the other way, you see. So it doesn't help to ignore certain things. So what we will touch on some slightly more complex bits that we have to try and un resolve tonight but we're going to look at the the passover um so i can't remember what, what i put on my slides i was only doing them earlier today but i've forgotten <laughs> forget i forget what, what we put in by the time you get to the end um yeah so there we go if you remember last time we were looking at, at um at actually how there was a historical document um you know the uh, the admonitions of the sage in which a character called ipua um, uh, advises a, a pharaoh who's come just after a generation after um, a calamity where f caused by foreigners um, and um, we, we'd seen a whole load of things he said and saw how they tied up totally with, with Exodus and we if you remember from a timing point of view the reason why it's almost never connected with Exodus is because he's too old um, but as we've seen already um, actually the Bible tends to actually puts the Exodus earlier than most Christians kind of have, have heard it to be 
Um, and then if you match that with the, the rework that's going on in, in Egyptian chronology that's bringing Egyptian chronology forwards, <laughs> so the, our Bible kind of chronology is going backwards, they're actually now suddenly, they, they match at the same point. They're both in the 12th dynasty. And, or, or actually the, the Ipawa is in the 13th, but writing about the previous years. So he's come just after. So in other words, he's now writing at the right point. So in the, in the Bible, we've got it happened at midnight <clears throat> that Yahweh struck all of the firstborn in the land of Egypt. From the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captives, who was in the dungeon, there was a great wailing in Egypt, and there was not a house that, without, that was there without its dead. So what we read in, in the sage, or the admonitions of the sage, is Ippua says, Behold, plague sweeps the land. So he calls it a plague. Blood is everywhere. There's no shortage of the dead. Children are dashed against the walls. It's an interesting little comment. Um, the funeral shrouds call out to you. He who buries his brother in the ground is everywhere. Wailing is throughout the land, mingled with lamentations. And so you have a very kind of independent text. It's not based on the Bible, but it, you, you can see it quite easily as a, as a kind of a, an outsider or, a, or another perspective on the same event, um, if I put that way. Um, and um, we, we, I think we touched on this last time. I've put them onto the, onto the slide records now. Um, but uh, what have I got? Yeah, that um, then actually um, in the uh, the town of Avaris, which is in the region that the Bible calls Goshen, um, in actual fact that there are a number of plague pits that have been found at the end of uh, is, here. I've got the quote for it. The end of this stratum is actually the the stratum that covers. The, in, the end of the second intermediate period that we've been talking about, we've been looking at. So at the end of this period, we suddenly find there are graves where the bodies have just been tossed in. So instead of going through the complex funeral rites, which Egypt is famous for, they've just thrown and piled bodies up. Um, so this is the kind of the technical description from the excavation. Um, so the end of this stratum seems to have been constructed with a tra connected with a tragedy. Unprotected burials were found, in contrast to the often seen burials in ordinary chamber tombs. Bodies were sometimes thrown into the pit several at a time. It's very likely the burials resulted from an epidemic, um, which actually is a, you know, as I say, that's the that's a modern take on discovering these um, these um, funeral pits. Um, but as I said, there's um, there's evidence, or we find it in the papyruses of the 13th dynasty that refer to the Asiatic flu, I uh, not flu, sorry, that's getting too much of the Australian flu in my head at the moment. <laughs> Asiatic um, plague. There's a plague that was seen to be associated with those foreigners who are part of the country. The same foreigners who Ipua is blaming for the catastrophes that have fallen on Egypt that he's described and we've seen with no grain in the fields and um, darkness over the land. All of those things that he describes, which we also read in Exodus. And so there's a kind of a nice tie up. They're not instantly connected, but they're all falling into the same space. They're all falling into the same region. Um, they, uh, probably, probably, yeah. Yeah, because with, with um, organic matter, um, you know, carbon dating at this stage is reasonably, reasonably OK. The, the only problem with all um, radioactive dating is it, it 99 times out of 100, it works fine. Um, but there's always the chance of the one time where something has happened that's accelerated um, a process. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I, um, all I know is that they, they date it roughly to this, this period of the, the uh, second end of the second intermediate period. Um, so let's keep going. Sorry, yeah. So there, yeah, there's. Um, so we, yeah, we. It's really that's just clear, clearing up or finishing off what we were looking at last week, which is the end of that plague process. Um, and um, although we've probably forgotten it from last time, we actually saw that it kind of, it starts with the Nile inundation, which happens during the summer. Um, it's kind of worked through September, October with the other plagues, and we saw the the the, um, the frogs come out in September. Gnats and flies are at their peak in October. We kind of so we've been kind of following through. Um, the um, darkness is likely to be caused by. Um, uh, uh, it, it, sorry, uh, I'm just working out how much how complicated we go at this stage. Uh, that sounds really arrogant. It sounds like I'm. Um, it's just um, I don't want to detract too much. Um, at the begin, just before we get to traditional Passover season and through Passover season. North Africa and Asia get huge, these huge dust storms and they can go up quite high and they can cause darkness. 
Um, so there's darkness for three days, and actually that would then we're pushing now towards um, Passover time, and of course that's the, the penultimate before the darkness comes, and then of course it's the um, it is actually the Passover. So we we've kind of got a nice run of dates. We're noticing they're not all just happening one day, second day, third day, but we've taken nearly a year since the beginning of the plagues running through. So nine, nine, somewhere nine to ten months or so that we've been running through. Um, and we're getting to this point. Um, and um, we touched on the issue of um, is, uh, um, is uh, what, what is the cause of this? And at, at a certain level, just because we've been looking at seeing natural causes, we don't ever, neither we did, do we want to discount the supernatural causes. <laughs> um, and it's part of the, um, the kind of premise that we've been working with, which is, that the God's use of the natural processes is what gives us the ability to try and lock these into a time in history. And um, we, if we want to strip that out totally, that's fine. We can do that. But the trouble is, at that point, you're working with something that you can kind of move anywhere. Um, you can't kind of lock it in. So if we're going to lock it into a time in history, we have to say, well, there's not a problem with the idea of God using a natural phenomenon and giving it something beyond. I and mean, it may well therefore be that we see the, the death of the Egyptian firstborns as kind of something that is difficult to describe outside of some su su supernatural intervention. Um, but it's not impossible, and I just wanted to touch on it, you noticed in the in the statement from Ipua, the children's heads are dashed against the wall. Because <laughs> we saw during last week that actually the religious framework, which has become the structure and security, has failed. First of all, it's failed to keep up with the miracles, and then it's got the, the priests have become covered in boils, and they're not able to stand before Moses, which we just kind of read as it's a bit embarrassing, but it's not. It, in terms of Egyptian um, kind of uh, religious thinking, they are no longer fit to, to administer anything. So the people are in a desperate state. They need to offer sacrifices. They need to appease the gods who are, <laughs> who are doing them in, and there's nobody to advise them or give them any help. Um, and so you can imagine a, a certain level to which you could, I, I tend to think perhaps, as we're looking at this phenomenon, that there's a range of things at play. And um, whether some of it is to do um, with, uh, uh, which has been suggested, um, that the damp crops, as they've been harvested in, the wheat, uh, may have actually got infected with the ergot fungus. Um, wheat is quite a small grain, and normally ergot doesn't make a big thing in it, but it can do, just like with all of them. Um, and so if that is the case, has that grown in the top layer and therefore the, the firstborn to eat first? <laughs> have they eaten more of it? Or is it quite simply that that has also meant that they're all going slightly mad? Because, um, you know, if you know the um, ergot fungus is, is now the strongest understanding, the kind of the universally accepted uh, no, that's not true, universally accepted, but the widely accepted in academic circles understanding of the Salem witch trials um, is um, that actually because all of the phenomena that go on there are related to the in ingesting of um, ergot infected fungus, including the hallucin halluc um, hallucinations and paranoia that becomes violent. Those are all part of it. So you could imagine that the damaged crops have got that infection and those have been eaten by the by the Egyptians and now the, there's no priests to advise them and they fall back into the ancient practices of the sacrifice of firstborns. If you remember um, in the book of Joshua, when they're, I can't remember which city it is, isn't it? you remember they were besieging and the, the, the king of that city comes out and sacrifices his son on the walls. And so the, the children of Israel are so shocked they turn around and leave. Um, and so his kind of, if you like, his extreme sacrifice actually shocks them so much they, they don't take the city it's their failure in that sense um, but that is if you like one of the default fallbacks of people in the superstitious ancient world which is the best thing i have is my firstborn um, it could be a firstborn animals <laughs> my firstborn animal is best so we start with that and if that's not working do we start does it start a kind of um, a ritual sacrifice and again I'm, I'm speculating but you're just saying this is the kind of the process of real real people um, and how it, you know, how do they behave and how do they work? Um, in the meantime, of course, um, uh, why have I done, I'm just trying to remember why in my mind, probably because I intended to put some other slides in and I've forgotten them. <laughs> um, but um, the, the Israelites, of course, um, yeah, I think I was going to put a whole section in on the Passover lamb and I ran out of time. <laughs> so I'll just, 
you know, in um, when we're in writing the book, of course, the whole focus of the book is how does Exodus show us Jesus? So it would be very different from what we're doing here. And of course, we would highlight how often the, the Passover is referenced in the New Testament. Jesus is is kind of seen as the fulfillment. He's the the Lamb slain without broken bodies. He's the perfect Lamb. Peter says um, he's without spot or blemish, and so on and so forth. And so their their own the, the, the death in the there is a death in um in the Egyptian household. Sorry, in the Israelite household. But it's a substitutionary death. It's not not a it's not actually a family death. It's kind of a an on behalf of, and that's the the death of the the Lamb. Um, and coming out, um, that lamb is actually referred to um, as um, uh, um, uh, as a as a hymn or an it. It's technically as a hymn because there's no it in Hebrew. <laughs> um, but it's referred to as an it. And the way that it's written in Hebrew is with three little Greek, not three Greek, three ancient Hebrew Hebrew letters, um, which actually, if you rearrange them, make the word the sign. And I've got them there: the Aleph and the which is the the bull's head, which is the biggest domestic sacrifice. Um, the nail or the pin or the hook, the name Yod still means hook or peg, um, which is drawn as a stake, um, and two cross sticks. Um, so the sign, which is always used for the sign of what God is doing, um, is actually made up of three letters that pictographically, remember the pictographic language has developed with these Hebrews in Egypt. We know that from archaeology. It's been the oldest occurrences of this world's first consonantal language appear in Egypt. And they write Semitic, but they are they're writing at a time when people think that the Jews or the Israelites weren't there. So they assume it's a pre-Semitic language. But we've seen actually if it, if um, if you take the Exodus back, the um, the world's first consonantal language, um, written language, has developed at the time when the Isra Israelis or the Israelites are living in Egypt, using Egyptian hieroglyphs to stand for letters and vowels, the consonants and vowels. People often say, oh, I thought Hebrew only has consonants. It's actually, it uses consonants as vowels. Like we use the, the um, sometimes we use the, the consonant Y as a vowel, don't we, see? So it has letters that can be either. So they're consonants, but they're also vowels. And in the, those pictograms, um, each of those pictograms, you find that the Hebrew words tend to tell a story um, that actually represents the word. Um, so... Um, uh, the uh, the sign that God gives is made up of a sacrifice, a nail, and a cross. Um, and the first time the, the Passover lamb is referred to, or the, not the first time, the time uh, when it's referred to you taking it or taking him into the house, the little word him is the, is the Aleph Tav, the first and last letters of the alphabet, which we don't pronounce, but they put emphasis on something, with um, with the little word you, which is what makes it an it or a him. So it's the, the special him. Um, so we've got the same the same mix of letters. We've got a sacrifice, a nail, and a cross. <laughs> um, so the sign and the Passover lamb are both made up of those symbols. Just as a quick little throwaway thought, I was just thinking about this today, um, because I was um, <laughs> when I was kind of reading something, because I, I I read both kind of critical positions as well. And one of the things is, well, you know, there aren't any, there weren't any domesticated camels at this time in Egypt. Is one of the complaints, which we don't know for sure. But even if they, there was, um, many um, those, of those who studied the, the words would say actually that the word for camel, himmel, sounds very much similar. So yeah, the word camel comes from gimel. <laughs> um, if you look at the pictograms, it's um, the, the letter, which is also called gimel, is actually pictographically was the letter of a foot walking. So it's a walking foot. Um, and um, the, uh, then the second letter of gimel is the mem, which is water. So it was like a bit of water, and the third um, was the lamech, which was a which was a um, was a crook and was used for leadership. And the story you get from it <laughs> is um, that the there there are things that you can you have to lead on foot to water, um, unlike for instance sheep, <laughs> which you can call. And so actually a sheep is an elf, um, which is made up as of little horned livestock animals. So it probably isn't a bull; it's probably just a livestock animal. And, um, a lamech, which is the shepherd's crook, but this time it's the lips because you only have to call the sheep. See the <laughs> now I know that this kind of sounds a bit silly, but there's a whole huge amount of academic work being done on the on if you like the um, the pictographic roots now now that people have started to understood the the things and people started to look at it again. It's amazing how many of these little pictograms actually mean something. 
Um, and so many of those folks would say even the word camel was actually more, more correctly an animal that you had to lead and it was often the beast of burden. So it could be even a, a donkey at the time. You know, it's just the thing that you had to, unlike a sheep, which you can just call, <laughs> it's a beast of burden that has to be led. Eventually they become the big ones because once they get domesticated, but before then it could have been an ox or it could have been a, a donkey and so on. So that, that's a really pointless, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm going to go off a total, total tangent. I find these things interesting. I, kind of say, I find myself saying that too often. I find them interesting. Um, but anyway, so this sign, um, you know, as we read about it, you should tell your firstborn son. So we're going to pass this on. That's what I was talking about before we started. This is the nature of the faith we have. It's something about how we pass it on. And, um, and we often kind of focus this just on... on um, evangelism because that's an important thing but actually we it's too easy to abdicate the responsibility of passing on our understanding to kind of what gets, happens on a Sunday with one person standing at the front if you see what I mean um, and actually part of the life of things and in fact if you ask me very often you discover most of the life of where church is at is often much more um, it won't necessarily peer to peer but it's 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 adult to adult kind of levels of passing on by which I mean is that, that um, you know, there are people, you know, who, who by weight of their wisdom and ex activity, I'm looking, you know, at Andrew with his work into, um, of course, it's unfair just not to look at, I could look at everyone around the room, couldn't I? But, you know, you look at Andrew with his years working into Turkey and places like that and his reading of scripture. That means that actually a new teenage Christian is not peer to peer, but it is adult to adult, you know, which is the, where the, you know, the, the idea of the synagogue, the learning together kind of comes comes out of and that I think is personally I think is is really kind of key and so it's not just in terms of we're supposed to evangelize it's more that actually evangelism is a subset of actually we are supposed to be and we discover part of the dynamic of our faith in how we try and pass on what we've got how we try and package what we've learned in a way that I can communicate and give to somebody else um, and they can get, they can take it, they mix it with what they've got, they try and package it and give it on. And that's, that is actually part of it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's easy to, I say reduce, it's easy to kind of strip down experience in our storytelling to all the miracles I've seen, you know, <laughs> like that. Um, which is kind of making me, making me kind of giving me kudos by being a, by being a um, spectator. <laughs> um, but I, actually it's how we really work these things in and pass them on so anyway he said so god tells them so you're going to tell your firstborn son on that day so you've got your new you've got your first child and actually of course it turns into the whole family but you know first i can remember my first child being born feeling an emotional change in me <laughs> as you become responsible for a generation that's coming up behind you um in, and you're going to tell them all about this story of how god did this and it will be a sign to you on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes that the law of Yahweh may be in your mouth. Um, so, of course, by Jesus' day, that, that um, command to be a sign had um, produced the phylacteries, um, which are the Hebrew word is tefillin. The, the, the Greek word means a little amulet and the Greek world had phylacteries with things to other gods in them. But they had become those little things that you strapped onto your hand and you strapped onto your heads. Um, and they contained and that 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 rather strange looking thing there is a is one that you put on your head It's much bigger than we often think nowadays because we made them neat and small. So they have a, you have a leather pouch and you see the, the four little kind of rolled up bits are four little bits of script and they've got four scriptures. And they're the four times when God tells them to do this four times. God tells them they should pass on. They're going to pass on and tell their kids and they're going to tell the stories. and They're going to make sure they know them. And so I've got the scriptures there. They'd they'd literally bind them up in leather. They'd bind them um, uh, onto the hand as well. Um, and of course, in Jesus's day, Jesus doesn't tell them off for wearing them because, in one sense, it's uh, they're just being biblical. The thing he says, which you can see a little bit from this uh, picture here, is people used to make them big and ostentatious, <laughs> um, so everybody could know and make them as inconvenient as possible. Um, you know, and um, as they bind them onto the heads and hands to kind of just show how religious they're being. But what's interesting is that every one of the, the texts that's in there has this little phrase in it. It shall be a sign. And it's always written with that little sacrifice and nail and a cross. So on the heads and the hands, they're walking around with, um, with, with, a, 
with a script at least um, that uh, appears at least four times. No, sorry, eight times, um, because they um, they they've got four the four texts on their hands, four on their heads, so eight. And um, there were uh, uh, and there were apparently the rabbis used to argue about whether it should be left or right, and so some to kind of hedge their bets and put it on <laughs> put it on left and right. So then you go up to twelve. So but what I'm kind of getting across is is generation after generation after generation if they stopped and unrolled those things and looked at them and thought about the meanings of the letters um saw that god's sign was always a big sacrifice and a cross if i can put it that way <laughs> um, and it's the first and the last yeah and, and joined with the nail joined with the nail there <laughs> so it is the first and the last you're absolutely right the aleph and the tav and it's the and uh, but actually kind of written and uh, and as i said and, and and if you read the, the the reference, I think it's when it talks about you know, on the tenth day bring it into the house, and that it is actually the is Aleph and the Tav, which is that um, little word that we don't articulate, which just kind of says this is an important word, and then it's with a wav at the end of it. So we've got the same three symbols: um, a domestic sacrifice, a nail, and a cross. So it's the Passover, and it's the sign that they're going to carry right the way through. So, oops. Okay. And so, um, because they, um, they, because of the, uh, the, the the tragedy of what happens, they, um, Pharaoh can't get rid of them quick enough at this stage and wants them to go. Um, and you know, we read about them asking and from their neighbours and collecting silver and and so on. And just to kind of understand it in its context, particularly if you if if there is something of the death of the firstborn, which has kind of become a a religious fervor madness because of everything that's going wrong um, and actually the hebrews are coming out untouched you can actually see this kind of offering to them is a, it can almost have a super superstitious element to it and so they're told to kind of ask and um, and they do and they get given huge amounts of gold and silver um, and actually i haven't put it on there which is really annoying but um, we have a quote again from ipua who talks about how bad it all goes and says um, which i don't think i've got on these notes and complains about the fact that that slaves are going around with gold and silver while the people are left destitute. Mm. Oh, it isn't there. It's on the next one, is it? Oh, yeah, I did. It was on the first page, was it? Oh, right, okay. Yeah, so it was there. Yeah, so they've uh, so they, they go off in those ways. So we get to the verse. So the sons of Israel travelled um, from Ramesses to Sukkoth. Uh, it's about six hundred thousand on foot who were men, besides children and families, is the way we tend to read it. A mixed multitude went up also with them, with flocks and herds and even much livestock. So this is Exodus 12, 37 to 38. And, and it hits up now one of the big headache problems, um, which I'm gonna, we're going to kind of look at from a headache point of view and then try and work out what's the best way of, of solving it. Um, because as I said, it's, it's very easy. All numbers, when they exist in our heads, are the same size. Um, <laughs> uh, it's when you actually have to physically fill up a fill up something with them that you notice the difference <laughs> in a number um so um if you if you take six if you take this um kind of as we read it here six hundred thousand on foot and so six thousand men of fighting age kind of in other words footmen or foot soldiers that can be they're presumably they're all married so there's six thousand wives um Oh, 600,000, not 6,000, yeah, 600,000 wives. 600,000 wives, yeah, you're right. Um, if we give them three children each, which is kind of being a little bit, you know, modest, modest yeah, to say three children each, that's 180, sorry, yeah, 180,000, sorry, 1,800,000, yeah. Um, and then if we kind of allow that they've had one parent surviving above them, you know, probably the mum. So we've been quite modest here all the way through. We get to a total of three million six hundred thousand plus a multitude of Egyptians. So that that figure doesn't bother some people because it is just a number and you don't actually have to do something with it. And and I want you to hear this carefully because I don't want to in any sense be dismissive. There are some quite remarkable things um, in the Bible, you know, <laughs> um, the crossing of the Red Sea, for instance, which we can look at certain natural processes, but it's always going to require something remarkable of the Lord involved in the mix um but the thing that is often tricky here is it, it it's not seen as remarkable when actually it is remarkable if, if you put them in and um, so if we kind of if i look at say what some of the problems are and this is part of the reason why 
you will regularly hear people saying, even when you present some of the things you've looked at to do with um, the, the kind of historicity of some of the accounts from the book of Exodus, will still say there's no evidence because at the end of the day, it all comes down to um, three and a half million minimum, okay, minimum, if I can put it that way, three and a half million people minimum leaves a big mark. I mean, you can't find it, you see. So, and if we think about why, we'll get, get this kind of little bit of a feel, hang on. Um, I said numbers aren't just confirmed, uh, numbers seem to be confirmed also in the book of Numbers. So we're going to, um, because if it was just in the book of Exodus, it wouldn't be too difficult, to put it that way. Because we're going to see there is an alternative translation to the couple of verses in Exodus. But, but when you come to Numbers, it just adds a slight different kind of um, twist on it. Um, and so you put the two together. So Numbers 121 onwards, there's a count by tribe. So that it starts right at the beginning. That's why the book of Numbers is called Numbers, is they take a census. Um, and those who were numbered of them, of the tribe of Reuben, were 46,500. And it goes on through the 12 tribes and adds them all up. You know, <laughs> Numbers 2, the count is summarised into four camps based around Judah, Reuben, Ephraim and Dan. So all those who were numbered of the camp of Judah were 186,000 and so on. So it's, it's texts like that and you can add them up and so on. You get, they only count the men? And they're um, only counting the men in this kind of context, yeah. Okay. yeah. So um, but, so you can see that this kind of 3.6 to 4 million is kind of seems to be both in Exodus and, and in Numbers. So just to highlight what the problem is, is... Um, <laughs> Uh, there's a kind of a problem with generations it's, and because the problems aren't just for the skeptical mind it does actually that number does actually create a problem in the narrative as well um, because if you look at certain things the, the the that number is is so big if i can be really blunt um well i'll come to the narrative bits as well what, what the problems they put into the text um so first of all the first thing is the bible only records three or four generations for any tribe that are of people who are actually born in Egypt. So you've, you've um, now, it's possible, because you take them one at a time, and I'll, I'll highlight this, it's possible because people who have studied ancient culture genealogies will say when a, num when you get a, when a genealogy line gets to kind of um, around 10, 12, 14, what will happen is slightly less significant ones will start to get dropped out because it's actually about memory. You see, it's, you, you remember your genealogy in so many generations. And so it, it's not, and you actually do see this in the New Testament when you go through Jesus's genealogy, which is probably the genealogy he learned, which they know has got some generations missing, but that's not uncommon actually in, in ancient world cultures because actually you learn things in certain sets of numbers. And after a while, you've got now 22, and, you, and that's too many to remember, so we, we want to go back down to 20. Or so. Actually, it's not that. It tends to be 12. We normally tend to work to 12, or in Jesus' case, 14. So that is a, a known phenomenon. It often confuses people because we, we think, is the Bible lying? It's not. It's recording the genealogy as people have learnt it. Does that make sense? It's not saying... This is some places it might be saying this is exactly how many, but then you hear somewhere else, you see another genealogy list, and a couple of names are missing, but that is common not just in the Bible but in common with all of those kind of Semitic cultures that maintained genealogies for legal reasons because actually your, your genealogy gave you status and position and land rights and all sorts of other things so you had to remember it and when you were traveling a long distance you would as, as for instance when Rebecca is met by the servant of um, Isaac you know he he will probably he establishes his um, validity by reciting the genealogy of his master and so because he, at a certain point you cross over and they match, we recognise you really are part of our family. Because that's the only way we do it, no passports or anything. <laughs> um, and so it, it, what all I'm saying is we do know that in the ancient world sometimes names would get dropped out. But we have no indication in any list, but we only have three or four generations. Um, and we get numbers, um, well sorry, those numbers, sorry, the, how old they are. So Levi lives to 137, Kohath to 133. Amram to 137, and then Moses is 80 years plus when the Exodus happens, um, which would kind of give us a range for the sojourn, the time in in, uh, in e Egypt, between 120 or three, 350 years, depending on exactly kind of what age um, the people were when they were born, which of course actually ties in quite nicely with Josephus claiming 215 years for the time in, in Egypt. Although, as we touched on last time, 
looks like he's just chopped the, the number for Egypt and Canaan in half. It's 430, he's just chopped the two in half. So he's probably not being precise, but it's roughly in the same ballpark um, if you look at the ages of those folks that, um, uh, that, that we were expecting. So we have, if that is the case, if we are talking just three or four generations, we've gone from 70 to um, three and a half to four million, which is quite a feat, mm -hmm. um, if I can put it that way. Um, so uh, to grow from 70, I was actually doing the maths this afternoon <laughs> um, on, my, uh, on my phone, you know, doing the kind of calculator. <laughs> uh, to grow from 70 to three and a half million in three generations implies that every couple, because of course you've got a couple, it's not 70 couples, it's 70 individuals. Every couple has to have 70 children, which is kind of nice, 70 produce 70, to create 35 future couples. So I've kind of put that down here. So you've got your original 70 made up of 35 couples. If they have 35, um, uh, if they have 70 kids or 35, that produces 35 couples, you do 35, 35, 35, you get to one and a half million. But remember, um, that's couples. So double that, you've got three. So, <laughs> but that actually is having 70 children per couple per couple um, <laughs> so maybe we assume some missing generations and at that level you can kind of get it to something that looks a little bit more reasonable because of the way things multiply up so if there were some missing generations you can maybe it becomes more somewhere around seven if you each each couple is having seven children which is slightly higher than the, than the biblical average so believe me people have actually done this <laughs> they've gone through all the genealogy lists worked out how many people, how many kids it seems that people are having. Um, and the, the um, it comes out about five, I think four or five is the kind of the average. Because obviously you get people like Leah who has, you see Jacob doesn't have 12 kids by one wife. So, so you really have to think of them as four couples. <laughs> so there's, there's him and Leah, him and Rebecca, just being rather obvious. I'm sure all of the women were fully aware of that. I'm sure most of the husbands hadn't worked that one out just yet. You know, <laughs> it's not not easy to have lots and lots of kids. Um, so, um, so a, a family size of eight, though, if that is the kind of the average, would mean at the point of going that that figure we got, that three and a half million, was based on an average family size of three kids, not eight kids. If it was eight kids, then actually we've suddenly jumped the number we should be targeting at um, to over six million. Is that, is that right? Hang on. Oh, no, over five million to over five million. So it's kind of a it's a shifting blessing. So you just I'm just kind of playing with the figures to kind of show what it is, is the problem here when you're looking from a historical point of view. Um, you've got other kind of little issues. Um, so in the text at the time of Moses' birth, there are just two midwives. So it's easy enough, again, to take one line at a time to say, oh, well, that's because only two got mentioned. They were actually loads. <laughs> Um, but that actually, obviously, if you've got two million people, sorry, not two million people, but if you've got, if you've got three and a half million people and they live 70 years, um, that means that, so you say we don't divide three million, three, three million, five hundred thousand by 70, sorry, I'm just, <laughs> which does kind of go, it's about five million a year, isn't it? So, but five million were born, no, hang on, no, not five. 500,000 or so, or was it 50,000? No, 50,000 every single year. So there were 50,000 children every single year for the last 70 years and being managed by two midwives. So you know there have to be more than that, but only two get mentioned. Um, then, then you get the things which, again, you can easily write off and say, well, we, we don't believe the archaeologists anyway. Um, but a lot of things we've looked at, like the, the, the grave pits and so on, you know, they add up the numbers of bodies in there and they also look at the... Um, we know how much um, the agriculture of the day is producing and therefore how many people it can sustain and so on. And archaeology tells us um, that Egypt's entire population during the second intermediate period is around two to three million. So we have potentially more Israelites leaving than actually live, including slaves, in Egypt at the time. You see, you see I'm just yeah. I, I'm not wanting to labour the point, but actually partly it's for my own sake, because I would love it to be simple, yeah. if that makes sense. I would love it to be simple, therefore I've, <coughs> I've gone through umpteen angles and I've come up with a solution that I'm kind of happy with, but I know that it takes time to kind of, you have to struggle with the issue to kind of get to, to kind of, um, to be comfortable with it. Um, and then you kind of add to this in terms of just the, the story that um, an army of 600,000 men is way beyond any comparable force of its day. 
Um, and so it, the, the weird thing is that the people are petrified because they're being chased by 600 chariots. And, and there's 600,000 fighting men, you see. Um, now, a chariot gives you an advantage of about 10 to 1. So, you know, um, actually 600,000 men and 600 chariots is, is about, actually, is, a, is kind of something for them to worry about, if I can put it that way. Pardon? Yeah. So, so no, sorry, that's 6,000. That was, oh, is it? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So it's still, yeah, okay. Even, even with the six, yeah. So 600,000 men... You know, it's not really a problem if um, against a chariot, ten to uh, six hundred, giving you a ten to one kind of benefit would allow you to deal with a, a population of six thousand fighting men, but not six hundred thousand fighting men. Um, remember in the story of Abraham when he goes and fights those kings, he, um, he goes off and fights five kings who've come down with all their armies. We don't know the number of their armies, but he takes three hundred men off to fight them. Um, the biggest city populations in the, the promised land which they're heading towards which have all been excavated can maintain a fighting force of a few thousand men at a time so again it raises this question of what's jericho really what, what's joshua bothered with the jericho when he's got that number of people to go if it can turn out five or six thousand to fight back um even though it's it's a, a walled city they've got it's not not too big a big a problem um, and in Judges, Gideon raises a force of 32,000 men to start with. You know, it goes down to 300, but that's his kind of, he's raised that from across all of the tribes, um, which numbers wise, you know, about 300 years later is kind of much strength in its kind of pop, in its deal. Then, then you have the one which I remember as a kid. Sorry, this is, sounds really arrogant when I say this. It was the bit I could never get my head around. And nobody seemed to ask this question when I was just kind of learning in Sunday school which was actually that there were certain kind of logistical problems that certain types of kids do worry about. <laughs> um, so if you've got a camp for three million people, um, it's at least five miles by five miles in size, dimensions wise. Okay. Um, and, and if you're an unfortunate enough to be a Levite, because in Deuteronomy it says the Levites have to be in the middle of the camp. If they have to be in the middle of the camp, people are in instructed, they're not allowed to do their business in the camp. They have to go to a place outside the camp. So it's a five month. So this is what I mean by these are the kind of logistical problems that used to bother me. <laughs> it's a five mile trip. It's, um, there are, the city of Birmingham has 1.2 million people living in it. So you imagine living in the middle of Birmingham. You see, because that five miles is pretty tight packed. It's not that's not comfortable camping. Mm. That's kind of tight, giving shoulder you to giving you not quite shoulder to shoulder. I've given people enough room to kind of lie down and whatever. But um, and with their cattle and so on. Gone, you're going to ask something. Are the um, I remember doing a study in this before. Aren't the tribes laid out in the form of a cross, usually from the air? Yeah, so well, they're all in one big dense rectangle. Yeah. Actually spread out over. Well, we we don't. It's a. It, sometimes we draw it that way. We Based all it says is that there's one on the east camp, side, yeah, one on the. Camp this side, yeah. this side. I've seen studies of yeah. it, so it's, it doesn't seem to suggest it's the shape of a cross, which is remarkable, but. Yeah. Not a dense rectangle. Of yeah. Although the the um the reason we've done it in that way is it's not, it doesn't the, the text doesn't say it just says that, that there's the camp on the east and left and it's got the numbers in it and so on. Yeah. So yeah, but it's, it, I, I'm because I'm kind of um, and then of course you've got the thing that twelve springs in Elim provides water for everybody. Um, so um, and, and I didn't do it because I, I knew it'd be, it'd be kind of pedantic, but actually people have done it. It's, it's the pressure therefore of the springs that have to produce. Because the logistically, I saw an army logist, logician who was saying, who was saying on the um, on a three and a half million um, number, um, you need um, uh, with um, a family and livestock, it requires an average of um, two um, two gallons per head when you've got livestock as well, because they do take livestock with them. So if you're talking, you're talking kind of um, six or seven, seven million liter of gallons of water. Um, every day and so on um, and actually you know so really what I'm driving at is, is, is it does kind of create these sort of issues and I can remember as a kid my issue wasn't to do with going outside the camp it was how long is the how long is the line you know <laughs> and because if you watch the things and I remember sitting there trying to work it out and I gave up at that point um, but actually um, that, that became more of an issue funny enough so I was a steward on the March for Jesus. If you, anyone remember going on the March for Jesus, so 
So the best estimate was 70,000 people turned up for that. And it could have been up to 100,000. Police estimated 60, television said 75. Um, um, you know, and, and the organisers, um, if you talk to Gerald, it's probably a couple of million, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but they, they're not, so it's, some, it, it's 70 or 80,000 people. And, um, and they were walking about 20 abreast, and I was a steward, so I, I, I was on the route, and I watched the first crowd coming, and there's 20 to 30 maybe abreast. And um, they walked less than two miles from Jubilee Gardens area up to <coughs> Hyde Park, um, which is, I think, just under two miles, because I kind of do it kind of reasonably regularly, trying to think how long it takes me now, because I do stuff up in the centre of town. And it took them four hours <laughs> to go to get that, that, route, that group through. Does that make sense? And that is because large groups walk very slowly and because you tend to compress up because the, 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 the width is changing the whole time. So people have to move in and out, which means that then people kind of um, uh, kind of butt up and then there's a compression wave that works back. So it's not like an individual walking freely. The, the speed at which you can walk with a large group goes down. Um, so you've got just this kind of issue of, um, of bottleneck points. Um, as they're they're travelling, um, and the, so there's although there's parts of the train in both in Midian and Sinai which are kind of large plain areas, there are also bits going through mountain regions where actually the passes do kind of narrow right down. It doesn't have to be that everywhere, and it only has to be that one place you see for that compression problem to run all the way back up the line. Um, and so, as I said, it would make uh, if you if you allow them to be able to do twenty to thirty people like the march for Jesus was. Um, all the way, it's still 75 miles from start to finish, which is more than three days travelling at easy walking pace, let alone... So you, you, you see the why I'm saying the, the thing kind of creates this problem. Now, there's an easy solution for the book of Exodus. <laughs> easy solution for the book of Exodus. It's complicated a little bit by numbers, and we have to juggle that in a second. Um, hang on. So when the census is, is taken, um, there. Uh, oh, sorry, this is the last another bit of logistical problem, and this is quite a key one because we're told exactly on what day the census is taken, and it's all completed in one day, and they have to call out their names according to their families, and so the head of the family has to call out the names of everyone in their family, and they number them up, so everyone who is counted is numbered at the same time. Does that make sense? So I, I practiced earlier today <laughs> saying, I'm Kristen Forster, son of Roger Forster, son of Cyril Forster. There you go. I never knew my granddad's name was that until tonight. <laughs> I, I gave myself five seconds you know, for that bit of a gap for the next person to start. Does that make sense? So 20 in a minute. You can do 20 in a minute. <laughs> so 60 mi minutes in an hour. So you've got... Uh, What's that? 1,200 uh, 1, um, in an hour. We've got 24 hours. You see, so it actually it takes days, 21 days non-stop. Um, and that's if you've got everybody organised so they know exactly when to say what they're saying. Does that make sense? Yes. And that's all presented on a particular date. <coughs> you going to say something, Andrew? <laughs> no, no. Yeah. So I'm, I, I, I'm oh, really... Andrew's part of the thing is that I do want to be cautious because I don't want in any sense to lose the the sense of both the inspiration and the authority of scripture. Um, but um, part of the thing that I think is, is what, what we have to do in terms of the, is, is actually to understand the way, as you were saying at the beginning, that the Lord allows a certain amount of hands and so on to get in, involved in it. So the funny thing is, this is, a pro is not a problem for secular historians when it comes to the, the narrative. There are two camps, one of which doesn't work for us at all. They're the camp that just says, well, they exaggerated. And the others that actually make the very valid point <laughs> that the Hebrew word for a thousand meant something very different um, uh, uh, back in the day. <laughs> and we can chase its roots. And, and so there is a kind of a question mark over it, <laughs> which comes down to. So the sons of Israel traveled from Ramesses to Sukkoth, about 600,000. The, the word there is Aleph or LF, um, it, it's, um, if you look it up, it's um, Strong's number 504. The, the problem with the Strong's number system is um, if, um, if you translate a single Hebrew word two different ways, it sometimes gives them, not every time, but sometimes it gives them two Strong's numbers, even though it's the same Hebrew word. 
And it also delineates between words that in the Masoretic text are, are spelt with different vowel points. But of course, back in when Jesus was walking around, um, those vowel pointers weren't there. So there was just one word that covered about six or seven different Strong's numbers in the worst case scenarios. <coughs> so very commonly, you have a single Hebrew word that's given us two or three um, Strong's numbers. Sometimes it can be as a huge number of Strong's numbers because of different variations as to how it's used at different points in the history. Does that make sense? So the Hebrew spelling here and in the list in the books in uh, the book of numbers is exactly the same as the word that we also find for family or for family heads, chiefs or even troop leaders, which is H441. But they're both spelled exactly that way. Um, so the Aleph, Lamech and then um, uh, the foe, the kind of sound. Yeah. Is it foe? I think. Yeah. Um, which means that the Exodus passage, you can translate. I, I did my translation and I actually found in the Ancient Hebrew Research Centre, they've got a translation as well later. I quite like both of them, so I put them both up. <laughs> so the sons of Israel travelled from Ramesses to Sukkoth, about 600 chiefs, valiant troops representing families. Um, a mixed multitude went up with them, with their flocks and herds and even very much livestock. And so I've, I've just literally pulled out. It's got the, the pointing on it, just using my online software, the, the Hebrew text <coughs> uh, from the Masoretic text of that verse. And colour highlighted each word there so you can see it and the um, the ancient Hebrew research centre I think does it perhaps a little bit more elegantly 600 chiefs on foot are warriors apart from the children is the way they, they do it um, the, the the word for apart means to be kind of set aside from which is why it can be representing as I've got it in mind but you can get the, the feel there of that verse it kind of gives you a different possibility doesn't it and that's that's nice and straightforward so that that would be a really simple, straightforward solution if it wasn't <laughs> if it wasn't sorry, sorry, it sounds terrible, doesn't it? Um, I put it that way. Because the book of Numbers actually um, every now and again it sums up the figures, and the figures only work if Aleph at this point really does mean a thousand rather than. Um, uh, and the, the only thing I can say at this stage when you're trying to deal with this is that um, uh, in the um, uh, you don't have to have kind of gone down the uh, uh, the really sort of destructive, um, critical route um, to understand how um, that the the way in which the Bible has come to us has gone through various stages, which brought together certain sources to be re-edited together and so on. And when that source theory was first pr produced and evidence was looked for it and found. Um, it was actually a very evangelical theory and it actually makes sense of archaeology because the change of medium means that to maintain them they have to be copied and they have to be drawn together. So the, 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 um, there's normally two phases. There's Solomon's temple becomes a point of consolidating. A Solomon's temple a generation or so later the northern tribes are being eaten into by the Assyrians and they're coming down and um, Jewish tradition tells us that they're bringing their own copies of scripture with them. Um, and at that point, the priests of which Jeremiah is one of the senior kind of scribal priests, according to Jewish tradition, are oversighting the kind of consolidating of those things onto the new mediums and, and so on, into the, and the new forms of writing. So there is a kind of a clear moment happening at about that period where a, a key, a key <coughs> version or edition of the Bible is coming together from older sources. And so you can easily imagine how in that context where now Aleph means a thousand always, <laughs> put it that way um, they, they're reading about the tribal chiefs and so on and they they turn it into the 1000 um, so that would be easy except that because as I say numbers we've also got this issue now numbers is is traditionally recognized while it still contains material from Moses um, it seems to have been collated later and we can tell that from the, um, the style of the grammar that is used it's not the kind of thing that is easy to do but in the same way that it, with an English book if you if you pick up Chaucer, you can tell the difference between Chaucer and Ian Fleming in an instant. You know, <laughs> they're both English. You know, well maybe Chaucer kind of <laughs> Shakespeare then Shakespeare and Ian Fleming. They're both English, but we can spot the difference straight away. And um, and it's to do with things like as we talked about things like the A left tab, that little marker gets changed. It, it, there's a different way of emphasising words as times get later. And so, however it's come together, Deuteronomy comes into its final form later than Exodus. Does that make sense? 
Um, and so the, the only thing I can suggest, um, because it's quite possible if we want to divorce it from trying to, to match at all, we can just take the story and say, I believe that, if you see what I mean, you know, that way. Um, and I don't actually have a problem with that, just being really honest, except I, I, I find that for me, it's helpful to be able to see how things root into real history as well. And this is part of that process. Um, so the, is that um, that so in that first wave of coming together, consolidating the book of Exodus from its 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 clay and, and stone forms that are now getting broken up or whatever or falling apart and they, they're putting it together. Um, and as the and as the texts come down and the the, the ostracon I think they're called is it, is it ostracon no ostraka ostraka that's right but they which are the clay to, the clay plates that they've written onto they're bringing those down with them and but they do break up they don't last forever and so they want to draw them all together so Exodus is brought together first and at that point as they're reading the original source they've translated Aleph as thousands instead of um, if you if we look at it, um, <clears throat> if we look at it in numbers. I think I've got a copy in numbers. You could translate, for instance, in numbers, the first of them of the tribe of Reuben. There were forty six leaders or chiefs, and five hundred men, i.e., five hundred forty six in total. Does that make making sense? So it's kind of like the first. Instead of it being forty six thousand five hundred men, it's saying forty six leaders and five hundred men. It's the way they. They say you could read it that way, which is 546 in total, which gives you, when you add up all of the fighting men, 6,000 fighting men, which suddenly is, is putting you much more into that framework where if you've got 600 chariots and you've got 600 fighting men, you're much more on an even keel. And if you're a nervous slave like people, it's probably they're not they're not fighting. They're not used to fighting and doing whatever. It's suddenly becoming a more more manageable amount. The only issue is that in the in the book of Numbers, oh my battery is running low. Why is that? That's what I'm just going to have to do. Sorry, <laughs> so that it doesn't um it doesn't die on me halfway through. Is I presumably no, that's turned on. That's turned on. And I think why is it? Okay, I. It says you might want to plug in your PC. Oh, this is all looking. Oh, right, it's not going to push down. There we go. So, yeah, it's now come back. <laughs> so we will survive. <laughs> we will survive. Um, so where were that? what was I just saying? Nearly done for this section as well. That, uh, uh, yes, yeah, so it comes it comes down to 6,000 fighting men. Oh, yeah, the, the only problem is that um, uh, the book of numbers, uh, uh, as you're going through it, puts in occasional totals. And the totals look like the thousands. And so what you'd have to say is it seems at that point, if maybe that um, someone has tried to kind of like done, done a little sum just to see if it was all adding up to kind of get there. Um, so that kind of throws in this question mark because it can be it can kind of throw you um, with it. For me, it sits on the very edge of what I find OK to live with in terms of understanding that there is no when I read my English Bible, there are a lot of decisions that scholars make before I get to see it. Um, so just last year, a brand new version of the New Testament text was released for future translations. So translations of the New Testament that were done in the last 10 or 15 years have used something called the Nestle Allen text, which is named after the two scholars, that went through all of the different sources. And every time there's a tiny change, one and the other, they compare the two. So actually, that looks like it's the, the that, that looks like it's the scribal error compared with this one. So it's not since the days of the King James has someone tried to use for the New Testament a single um, a single text, which is why some people say you shouldn't use anything other than the King James. That's the, the logic, because <laughs> it just used one text. But the text actually, it, even then, it's not totally true. The Textus Receptus wasn't a single text, but it was one that had been kind of put together and had, was accepted at that point. <laughs> But the, the texts are always drawn from various bits and materially they don't normally change anything. Um, there's something like 3,000 variances in the New Testament texts, only four of which make any real change to the meaning. It really is quite small because they're kind of things that are really obvious and missing. It's like the equivalent of a missing comma, a missing letter or a very s slight change of the tense of a word. Um, sometimes there's a, there's a word that's been missed out in the text just because someone's scribing quickly. Um, and so all we're doing is we're saying we know that people make errors and scholarship comes and tries to resolve those errors and it produces a text which we then translate from. 
Um, and that actually that is the nature of our faith, that we don't, as you do in Islam, you don't have a text that comes down perfect from heaven and is maintained perfectly. So if you're a Muslim, it's a problem when a couple of years ago, when one of the oldest texts which exists in Turkey was opened up for the first time in 100 years for scholars to look at it and discovered it's only got 40% of the verses that, and most of them are different from the standard Quran that you're taught every year, every week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it's immediately been sealed up and it's too precious now to be studied again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and because it hasn't, and it hasn't been looked at for 100 years. And that, that, that is the case for all the ancient texts. It's not saying it's totally unrelated, but there are huge numbers of differences, but nobody looks at them. <laughs> because it's actually a point of doctrine. that the, It's the perfect book, whereas the perfect word in, in Christianity is Jesus. And what we have is a, is a record that God has preserved for us by, by the guidance of, his, of the, the Holy Spirit over generation after generation. People have come together, tried to collate it, tried to even translate it. And somehow the Spirit has, has committed to being involved enough that we can have a confidence that as we engage with it, it leads us to Jesus. Does that make sense? So within that framework, I, I have a certain amount of flexibility. It's not a total carte blanche of understanding that the fact is we can pull these things out and we can see them. So it's not like it's a mystery that is a lie that was hidden that we would never find out. Does that make <laughs> sense? We can see where the things have crept in or you can see those, those things and, and we can have a proper debate and discussion and we can make ourselves accountable in our views and, and do it with the Holy Spirit. And that's part of us kind of, if you like, I'll finish on this point that, that I think in, in, in the balanced Christian life, we have three sources of authority, and I think believe all three um, lean on each other. So we, we actually have um, an accountability to the wider community, and that, that sometimes freaks you out, but I'll show you why in a second. There is an accountability of scripture, and there is an accountability of the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Um, and they all interplay against each other. So the, the books of the, the Bible that I have we have because of a bunch of the early church who sat around and debated it and we've accepted it from them. So we, to a degree, we have accepted, if you like, the wisdom of the accountability of the early church. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So we haven't included the Gospel of Thomas and we haven't included um, the Book of Enoch because as they debated and thought about it, they've cut those things out. I'm really grateful because they would be a headache if we had. <laughs> the Book of Enoch is full of mis misogynistic views. <laughs> Doesn't think much of women at all, Enoch, the sort of writer of the Book of Enoch. So, you know, that would be a problem. But fortunately, they realised that and they've, they've pushed it out. So so we, we, uh, we look for an accountability one to another as we discuss. This is how I see it. What do you think? Does that make sense? <laughs> accountability to each other. We have an accountability to this incredible text, because it is an incredible text, <laughs> but it was it was managed and put in place by people over generations, over generations, you know, not just the council of Nicaea, but, you know, <coughs> Jeremiah sitting there with his team of scribes, um, <laughs> Josiah, and, uh, and yeah, later on, you know, going all the way through and um, maintaining the thing. So we have people, we have the text, and we have the guidance of the Holy Spirit drawing it together. And those three things are always pointing us to what, what is our perfect word, which is which is the word, which is Jesus. Yeah, so, so anyway, so what we've done tonight so far in this first half, so we've just kind of had a quick look at the the Passover because that's the, the starter. We and use this issue of the the numbers to to highlight something about how do we how do we engage with and this debate and understand. Um, this text. My, my prayer is, and I'll finish praying this, is that I don't want us to lose confidence in authority, but more to kind of give us a more nuanced and, and sophisticated in the right way view of how this thing has worked. Because I, I, I found when I, when you first started to see these things, I found it very challenging. You know, it kind of wobbles you. And then you find, you think my choice is either to kind of which, and I think people genuinely go this way quite often. They either, they either fall out totally and everything kind of becomes up to just opinion, if that makes sense. Or they, they fall the other way, which is to believe in a kind of a blind way, um, which doesn't necessarily really engage with life. It just kind of puts the stories in a, in a kind of a box over here and, and my believing them is part of my faith, if that makes sense. Um, which actually has happened to a huge chunk of Judaism, just being really blunt, that someone who gets input from those sources 
you discover a lot of Judaism has got to that point. It's kind of accepted all sorts of things that you know they don't even believe that David is around. I'm, I'm Jewish. I don't even believe David was a proper king. You know, even though we've now discovered him, but we've discovered him written about. <laughs> but for a long time, but that's okay because these are my stories, and that's what makes me Jewish. Does that that makes sense? So you kind of fall into that sort of thing. Or we kind of lose all, this just becomes a free-for-all as to how we interpret it. I don't like that bit, so I won't bother accepting it and so on. Um, whereas I think what we're supposed to have is this kind of engaged approach where we're dealing with it, with the, the Holy Spirit and with the wider community and inputs and so on. And that, that those are the sources of authority and inspiration. That makes sense? <laughs> so, okay, well, let's, let's finish this section and pray and then... Then actually we'll do the fun bit, which is crossing the Red Sea. So in the second, so so Jesus, yeah, I do just um, we just well, it, we need your Spirit to guide us into all wisdom, and um, Lord, you know, I, you know, I constantly look and pray for those things. It's lovely when we see the resolutions. You go, aha, that's how it all works. But Jesus, just as we've dealt with this this evening, um, I pray you just kind of take us through that valley of all. Oh, that's a bit strange. <laughs> And actually to that place of actually, but actually I can see something of, of your grace and your authority in this as well. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Amen. So we'll have a tea break and...